struggled with addiction, uh, and he was having significant struggles with addiction in 2010, and leaving Congress was the right thing to do for him. Thankfully, uh, beginning in February of 2011, Patrick's now had over six years of continued sobriety, which is the, the longest stretch he's had in his adult life. Um, He's, he, he looks great. He has four or five kids. Four now. kids. Four kids. Can yeah. you imagine that he's like, he's 48, 50 now? And he's he, in turn 50 in yeah. July. So anyway, so. Yeah, and, he, and so he, he, he left Congress and he, he went to Atlantic City to find sobriety, surprisingly <laughs> enough. That's where his, his wife Amy uh, is, is from South Jersey. She lives yeah, she's in. She's a school, she was a school she teacher. She was a school teacher. She, yeah. she now works with us. She's brought so much clarity to his life, right? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's, along, along with the four kids. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's his rock. For her, Amy has really uh, been great for him, uh, really life-saving, probably. Um, and then, so after he, he gained sobriety and, and really got his life back on track, he realized that rather than running for office again, he wanted to start the Kennedy Forum. Um, and you know, this is you know, he sees the the discrimination people with mental illness and addiction face in this country, and particularly as it relates to parity, is the the medical civil rights issue of, of, of this generation. So he he, he goes to the mat. Every day, fighting for uh, you know, against discrimination, which is what the parity law was uh, designed to do. So, before I go around the room and, and have a, hear everyone introduce themselves, I just want to know your name and what state you're from, because we've been working in a lot of different states, and we hope to work in every state. State really, um, just keep in mind this is an incredibly complicated issue. Um, Although I heard somebody recently say that nobody knew healthcare could be so complicated. <laughs> it is complicated, and this might be the most complicated thing within healthcare. I mean, this is, it's, it's very complex. So please, as we're going through this, if I'm saying something that sounds like ancient Greek, or, 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 or maybe you speak ancient Greek or, or Latin or something like that, if you just don't understand it, please, please let me know and, and ask me to clarify because this, this can get very confusing. So, All right, uh, so Michelle, why don't you start? Just say your first, you know, your, your name and what state you're from so Tim gets a sense of what states are in here. Michelle Bowman, I'm from West Virginia. Roland Bame, I'm from Georgia. Mm -hmm. Haley Thompson, I'm from Virginia. Judy Batista, Hudson Valley, New York. Okay. Jane Smith, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Reed Dukowski, also Michigan. Uh, Lisa Odell, Wyoming. Okay. Yvonne Luna, California. Gregory Smerling. Sharon Glenn, Michigan. Carol Robinson, Illinois. Okay. Heather Freitas, California. Mm -hmm. Luciano Sabatini, New York. Monica Kale, from Wisconsin. Okay. Anna Ivan, South Dakota. Jennifer Warnick, Texas. Sue Pres Presto, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Kimmel, Pennsylvania. Ethan Clark, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Steve Moore, Illinois. Lisa Riley, New Hampshire. Kelly Boyd, Maine. Matt Boyd, Maine. Summer Nelly, Tennessee. Jennifer Preble, Montana. Okay. Justine McClare, Washington State. There you go. So that's, uh, I heard a lot of states that weren't here in the last meeting, and also a few states where we've had some great success, like Montana and, and Tennessee recently, as, as far as parity is concerned. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through the agenda. Uh, what we're going to go to, and again, the, I think the intention here is that as we go through, if you have questions, please feel free to ask them because this can get very complicated. And, and if you get lost early on, it, it's not you, you'll, you'll need to get that, get that clarified right away. We're going to talk about parity, just basic concept, you know, of what, what parity is. Uh, we're going to talk about parity laws, both the federal parity law, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act that, that Patrick Kennedy was the lead sponsor of, and then state laws because uh, there's numerous state laws. Uh, every state, except unfortunately Wyoming, uh, has, has a state law that is somehow relevant to parity. And then the, the way, we'll talk a little bit about how the state laws and federal law interact, because um, it, it's a fair question to ask is that, well, if we have a federal law, why do we need to focus on the states? And that's a question I've been asked by, by legislators who, who do eventually sponsor the, the bills we have. Is that you know you can you can go beyond you know we don't have full implementation of the federal parity law and we need states that, you know have to be a big part of, of implementing the law and especially now with with the realities that might be folks there are more seats up front come on up front the realities that might be taking place with with federal legislation um, we may need states to even pick up more of the slack and then we'll go into parity enforcement what that looks like. Uh, and then what non-compliance with parity looks like, um, and that's that's the big issue. That's why that's why we're here today. Because even though we've had the federal law in place for almost a decade, and we've had many state laws in place, we still do not have full compliance with the federal parity law. I mean, let me make that very clear. Uh, th there's still a lot of work to do in terms of getting actual parity so that insurance coverage for mental health is the same as insurance coverage for other medical care. 
And then also we'll talk finally about what are we doing in the states? What does that look like? What does our, our approach look like in, in the states that we have worked in, the states that we, we intend to work in, and in all the states that we could work in? Um, so with that, and Tim, can I add, we're going to have the, his PowerPoint will be on the website next week along with a complete videotape. So you can take notes now, but know that you'll have an opportunity to get all of his materials. Okay, okay. so what is parity exactly? Uh, the general concept is that insurance coverage for mental health and addiction should be uh, the same as insurance coverage for other medical conditions. You know, the same terms and conditions, so, not, so you don't have a separate set of rules for mental health care as you do for other medical care, which sadly, for most of the history of, of health care in the United States of America, that was the case. And if you look at state laws today, uh, many state laws still have restrictions in place that are, are certainly more, more restrictive than what you have for other medical care. Um, and of course, that's the, the key. No more restrictive. That's what parity is all about. We want to make sure that insurance coverage for, for mental health treatment is not more restrictive than it is for other medical care, which sadly has been the reality throughout uh, you know, the history of, of mental health care in this country. And even though we've seen a lot of progress since the federal law went into place, there's still a lot of work to, to do. Okay, so parity laws. All right, the first thing to keep in mind is that parity laws are insurance laws, nothing more and nothing less. They are only re reflective of, of health insurance. Um, and insurance laws are, are, are complicated, generally speaking. And parity is incredibly complicated, specifically speaking. So I want you to look at that wall of words that's up on the screen there. That's a single sentence from the final regulation of, of, of the federal parity law. That's one sentence. And it's actually a very important sentence. I won't get into two details. But I'm going to do, I don't, please don't read it, because you'll probably, <laughs> you'll probably need treatment after reading it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll read it, though. A group health plan or health insurance coverage may not impose a non-quantitative treatment limitation with respect to mental health or substance use disorder benefits in any classification unless, under the terms of the plan or health insurance coverage, as written in an operation, any processes, strategies, evidentiary standards, or other factors used in applying the non-quantitative treatment limitation to mental health or substance use disorder benefits in the classification are comparable to and are applied no more stringently than the processes, strategies, evidentiary standards, or other factors used in applying the limitation with respect to medical surgical benefits in the classification. So if, if you, no, thank you. Um, yeah, I, should, I, I should read the, the end of those, those commercials where they read the, the, the fine print. Um, if, if, you, if you have never seen this sentence before and you read it right now and you understand what that means, I will propose that you should receive a MacArthur Genius Grant because this is, this is, this is I mean, I've read this sentence thousands of times. And even recently, a colleague of mine, we were sitting in a conference and we read it again for some reason and we were like, wait, does that really mean what we think it means? And then we're like, oh, I don't know. And then, then finally, after like 30 minutes of talking, we're like, oh, no, 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 it does. We did read that right the first thousand yeah. times we read it. Um, but it's incredibly complicated. So this, just to give you the picture, this is so confusing. I mean, you're not going to leave this meeting being an, an expert on this. It's just impossible. I mean, I've been working on this, this, this law for almost nothing but this law for the last three years. And even I feel like I learn things you know, new each day. Um, but that's the most important thing to understand. And, and, this, and this is, I think, the point that you're going to have to make clear at the state level to legislators and regulators, it is not fair to ask individuals and their families to try to understand this and determine if there's been a violation. This, this sentence right here, this is where we're seeing a lot of the violations in parity right now. It's not fair to ask the average person who's maybe suffering from mental illness or a family member who's burdened with, with denials of care to try to figure out if an insurance company has violated what's in this sentence. That's not fair. That should be up to, that should be the job of regulators. That's what they're supposed, that's, that's what a regulatory agency does. It's supposed to protect the public. Unfortunately, that's what we're not seeing enough of at the state level. We're seeing moves in the, in the right direction, but, but quite frankly, state insurance departments who are largely in, are responsible for enforcing this at the state level, they're not doing their job. They're not, they're not checking to see if insurers are doing this or not. Um, so that's the thing you need to understand. This is a complicated law and is not fair to ask individuals and their families to, to determine if, if there's compliance. That needs to be the job of a regulator. That's their job. Okay, so let's talk about the federal parity law. It's the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Um, it's, it was signed into law by, by President George W. Bush back in 2008. Uh, that's one thing to keep in mind. This, this is a bipartisan concept. Um, it, the bill was sponsored by Kennedy and signed into law by a Bush. So you have a political dynasty on the left and a political dynasty on the right, and they agreed this was important. Um, and, and that's when just a sidebar on the state level. Recently in Tennessee, where we had a successful bill, uh, we had a very conservative Republican lead sponsor and a very liberal uh, Democrat co-sponsor. 
uh, went through the Senate 32 nothing and went through the House 89 nothing, and the Governor Haslam signed it into law. Um, that's, that's bar that sounds bipartisan to me. So if you can get unanimous consent in the state. So that, that's just something to keep in mind. This is not a partisan issue. This is not, parity did not come out of the Affordable Care Act. It's not, it's not Obamacare. It has nothing to do with that. Um, now, the parity law, uh, when it was signed in, back in 2008, it only applied to large employer-sponsored uh, health plans and most Medicaid plans. Um, and then and with the, the federal parity law doesn't require insurers to cover any mental health treatment, but if they do, it has to be no more restrictive than how it, it is for other medical care. Um, now, and I'll get a little bit more into this in, in a minute, to say the Affordable Care Act has nothing to do with parity isn't quite true, because the Affordable Care Act did do is it extended parity to individual health insurance plans and small employer health insurance <coughs> plans. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how f the current federal legislation could affect that. Um, so now currently, as we sit here right now, June 14th, 2017, most health plans in the United States of America have to comply with the federal parity law. Uh, there's one huge exception, and that's Medicare. Medicare does not have to comply with the federal parity law. That is a big problem because Medicare has uh, a terrible uh, restriction limitation in place so that uh, Medicare will only cover 190 days of inpatient treatment for, for, for psychiatric treatment. So, that's, so once you get 190 days of treatment in your life, that's it for Medicare. Medicare won't cover any more than that, and that's a, that's a big problem. And that's also a big problem for, you might think, uh, you know, for, for people with serious mental illness, a lot of people like with schizophrenia uh, or bipolar disorder, they're, they're considered disabled, so they get their health insurance through Medicare. And so if you're 24 years old and you have schizophrenia and there's a 190-day limit on how much treatment, that's, that's probably not going to be, that might not be enough. So uh, just keep that in mind, that that is a big thing. I know we're here to focus on the states, but federally, got to get rid of that, that, that Medicare limitation. It's just, it's very discriminatory and it's, it's, a, it's a barrier to care. Okay, state parity laws. So just a little, little note about how state and federal law interplay. The federal parity law, it sets the floor. So, so, so you have a lot of state laws that are weaker than the federal law. So the federal law sets the floor. So if, if your state has, you know, say something that, that's not as generous as what's in the federal law, that doesn't matter. The state law, the federal law sets the floor. However, state laws like in the state of Illinois uh, or in Rhode Island, uh, state laws can go beyond the protections of the federal parity law. And so that's a lot of what our legislation is focused on and why the states matter. Um, state laws, you know, can, can augment the federal law. Uh, so generally speaking, if you look at state laws, and there's, there's a law relevant to parity in every single state except Wyoming, um, most of them are generally weaker than the federal parity law, uh, but some are generally stronger. Illinois has a, a fantastic law. Uh, it, it's definitely stronger than the federal parity law. Um, some are weaker than the federal parity law generally, but stronger in certain areas. And, and I'll get to a little bit more on that in, in a bit. Um, but for instance, the state of Kentucky, so the federal parity law is a little, it's a little weaselly uh, in terms of how it defines mental illness and substance use disorders. Uh, however, in Kentucky, even though that law, generally speaking, is weaker than the federal law, in, in terms of defining mental illnesses, it defines them as, as everything in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is a, a great way to define mental illness and better than the federal law. So some are weaker generally, but stronger in, in narrow areas. Um, so, of course, as I said, though, most plans in the country now have to comply with the federal parity law, at least as of today. Uh, so the weaker laws are much less relevant. And I would have said that much more confidently maybe back in, the, say, early November than I'm saying right now. Um, so that leads to a very logical question. What about the AHCA or, or whatever is happening in the Senate right now? Um, no matter what happens, the federal parity law will still be in effect for large group plans, most Medicaid enrollees and most non-federal governmental employee plans. Um, it, and that's because the law itself originally was, was signed in 2008 and those, it applied to all those plans back in 2008. So that's, that's not going to change with any federal legislation that's happening right now. Uh, it's very likely to still apply to individual plans. So the, the Affordable Care Act did amend the federal parity law to apply it to individual plans. I've seen no proposal in Congress that comes anywhere close to even uh, 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 you know, attacking that or, or reducing it. Because as I said, this has bipartisan support. Uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans both agree that, that parity is a good idea. Uh, so it's 99.9% .9 certain that, that you know, parity will still apply to individual plans no matter what happens in Congress. However, uh, for small group plans, that's where we might have a problem. 
Uh, so I think as you've heard that, that with the, 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 the federal legislation that went through the House, it would give states the option to get a waiver so they wouldn't have to for, for certain essential health benefits. So if you're a state and you get a waiver for mental health and addiction treatment, uh, that essentially then would remove the parity requirement because the parity requirement for the small group market is actually within federal regulations that were written by HHS so for essential health benefits. So that's just something to keep in mind and something that I think just to make sure that you, you talk about the state level is because that's one thing our legislation could be is a safeguard against that is that uh, if a state opts out of mental health and, and addiction essential health benefit, then, uh, then we're not going to have parity in the small group market. Um, so let's just move on to... Do you have a sense of how many people are covered by small group coverage? It's not a huge percentage, but it's, uh, I think it's probably about, I think that's maybe 10 to 12 percent of the market. So, I mean, it wouldn't it'd be a, a non-insignificant chunk. I mean, that's, it'd be, and, and then, of course, what would happen then is, is, the, is the parity would default back to whatever's in the state law. Uh, so if you have one of those state laws that's weaker uh, than, than the federal law, so, um, for instance, I think in Mississippi, you have uh, a limit on, you can only have 30 inpatient days in, in a year or 20 outpatient visits. That, of course, is no longer the case because of the federal parity law. But if the parity law doesn't apply, then that's what applies. And that's what you're going to see those plans do. Um, nope. So, OK, what's in the federal parity law? OK, so here's one of the things I mentioned. It's a little weaselly. So it defines, and we're going to get a little bit into the weeds here, but then we're going we're gonna to pull ourselves out of the weeds. Um, <laughs> It's, it defines that insurers the must. Swamp. <laughs> we'll try to drain it. I don't know if it's going to happen. So, the federal parity law requires that insurers define mental health conditions and substance use disorders in a way that is consistent with generally recognized independent standards of current medical practice. That's the quote. And it mentions that you could use the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual or the International Classification of Disease. It mentions those, but it doesn't require that. It basically leaves the definition part up to the insurance plans or as it's defined in state law. So that's one of the things our state-based legislation addresses. That's, that's less than ideal. I mean, I'll be honest. And that was something that, that Patrick has told me about in the, in the fight to get the federal parity law through. They just couldn't. They wanted to make it so that every, it's defined as everything in, in the DSM, and they just couldn't get it done. So it, this is a bit of a, a, a hedge. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's how it defines it. Um, and also one thing that, that, that is important to note is the federal parity law does not prohibit an insurance plan from having a blanket exclusion of certain conditions. And that's a, that's a huge problem. So some insurance plans will still refuse to cover certain types of conditions, like uh, you know, you know, some even will still exclude eating disorders. That's something that you need, you need help at the state level to, to fill. That's a big gap that needs to be filled in. Um, OK, so classifications of benefits, what are these? So you've got, you've got six classifications of benefits. Uh, you've got inpatient in-network, inpatient out-of-network, outpatient in-network, outpatient out-of-network, prescription drugs, and emergency care. Uh, so it's not, it's not important to understand the ins and outs of these classifications, but it is important to know that every form of treatment, every medication, every item, every service has to fall within one of these six classifications. Um, and the, the parity analysis takes place within each different classification. So you compare medical and surgical benefits in inpatient in-network to medical and or mental health and substance use benefits inpatient in-network, and you do it separately for each other classification. The most important thing about these is what insurers used to do uh, back when these classifications were first created, sometimes they would say, oh, well, uh, residential treatment, that doesn't fall into one of these classifications, so we don't have to meet parity for, for residential treatment or partial hospitalization. And that was a big problem that was in place from, from when the, the, the law was signed until the final regulations came out in 2013. Thankfully, the federal government did step in in 2013, it only took them five years, and said that, you, you, no, everything has to be within these six classifications. You can't say it's not in this, these six classifications, so therefore we don't have to meet parity. Um, so this is the framework of parity, and these are the, the classifications for which everything falls into. OK, so now we're going to get into a little more. This is where, as, as John mentioned, things get a little bit meaty. Um, so you have quantitative treatment limitations and financial requirements. These things uh, you have to be at parity. So what's a quantitative treatment limitation? Well, that could be an inpatient day limit. Uh, you know, so any, anything that limits the amount of care that you get uh, that can be measured with numbers, that's a quantitative treatment limitation. So let's say you know, some state laws have requirements that, that you know, there's a, a 45 day, uh, visit outpatient visit limit in place for, for mental health care. Um, 
Most of those numerical limits that you see in mental health care, those have been eliminated because most insurers don't use those kind of limits for other medical care. Um, and so, so that, that's one thing that we have seen a lot of improvement. And then also you see financial requirements, those are things like co-pays, co-insurance rates, deductibles. Uh, so those things can't be different for mental health care or they can't be more restrictive for mental health care than they are for medical care. I will say the insurance industry has done a very good job of coming into compliance with, with these issues. And it, it makes sense. This, this is all numbers. It's all, it's all math. It's pretty simple and straightforward as to how they would come into compliance with it. So they've done a good job. There's, there's still a little bit of problems with some of the smaller like regional health plans. But in terms of the big health insurers, the, the Aetnas, the Anthems, the Cignas, the Humanas, the Uniteds, they have done a good job of coming into compliance with this, uh, with these requirements. Um, so, so this is this is the sort of the, the first half of parity compliance, quantitative treatment limitations, financial requirements, and we do see that there is parity with that now. However, now here's the one that gets really confusing: non-quantitative treatment limitations. So, what what does that even mean? So a non-quantitative treatment limitation is something that can limit or restrict your care but can't be measured with numbers. So for instance, one thing that plans do a lot is you know, someone will be, you know, say someone's admitted to an in inpatient uh, residential facility and they're there for four days. And then the plan says, all right, we're going to check to see if your treatment <coughs> is still medically necessary. They review to see if the care is still medically necessary. That's a non-quantitative treatment limitation because if they say it's not medically necessary, they're limiting the amount of treatment you get, but there's no number in place. It's not like they're saying, oh, we're only going to cover four days. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll cover a certain amount of time, and then they'll review to see if it's, it's medically necessary. Uh, another thing they do is called fail-first requirements. So let's say your, your, uh, your provider says, all right, you, you need residential treatment. The insurance company says, well, no. You need to fail first at outpatient psychotherapy before we're going to cover residential treatment. And of course, well, what does that mean? Does that mean suicide attempt? Does, it, does that mean death? Does it mean drug overdose? Um, and often that's what happens. Um, so these, now I want to make clear though, it's not as if insurers can't use these things. It's just that they can't do them differently than how they do it for other medical care. So if you're in a residential treatment facility for, for mental health for severe depression, uh, and after four days, they review and see if in, in your provider says, no, the treatment is still medically necessary. And they say, well, you're not actively suicidal today. Well, well she was last night. Well, not right now at 9 a.m., so that's not medically necessary. Is that how they do it for, for someone who had a heart attack four days ago and is still in the hospital? Or someone who has cancer? So that, that's where these things in and of themselves aren't violations, but, but you know, the, the, you have to compare them to how they're done for, for medical care, and that's where we were having big problems with these things, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but this is, this is where the war is being fought right now, is on these non-quantitative treatment limitations. Okay, enforcement and non-compliance. Let's talk a little bit about enforcement. So uh, while nobody knew that health insurance, health care could be so complicated, it sure looks that way in terms of who's responsible for enforcement. Um, so who's responsible for enforcing the federal parity law in the federal government? Well, you've got the Department of Health and Human Services, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Department of Labor, Department of, of Treasury, somehow the IRS is involved in this. Um, uh, and then at the state level, you have state insurance departments and state Medicaid offices. If you wanted me to explain how, which agency is responsible and when and why, I hope you have about five or six hours and I'd be happy to, to tell you about it. Um, it's incredibly complicated. Uh, the way our, our, our federal health insurance system is set up, the way our health insurance system is set up in this country is just bizarre, arcane, and you would never, ever, ever draw it up this way if you were starting from scratch. Um, it's just a, it's a mess. There's just no other way to say it. Our, the, our, our health care landscape in this country is just not the way you want to draw it up. So what are we talking about here today, though, is at the state level. That's what I need you to focus on, though, and get your, wrap your mind around is at the, in the states, your state insurance department is the most important, uh, important regulatory agency to focus on. They're responsible for, for enforcing parity for a number of plans, uh, and, and every state can do it differently. Most state insurance departments have not done their job adequately. I can count on probably one, maybe two hands, the number of states that have, uh, insurance departments that have done a, a commendable job. Thankfully, 20 states uh, recently got uh, grant money from the federal government to, to in improve parity implementation. Uh, most They have not yet started doing that work. So things are going to get better, but uh, that's where we really need the emphasis in, in the state level is, and we'll talk more about this later, is uh, your state insurance department needs to do a better job, most of you. I heard some of you here were from California. 
that, that is a state that is doing a great job, but if you're not from California, your state insurance department probably could do a better job. Um, okay, so the new administration and parity. I think a lot of my, my friends and colleagues were uh, very worried that the new administration might mean that you just see a complete shutdown in terms of what's happening on parity. Well, first of all, uh, to his great credit, uh, President Trump did uh, appoint an opioid commission. Um, and he named Governor Christie the head commissioner of that. And he also named uh, Patrick Kennedy, the head of the Kennedy Forum, as one of the, the other five commissioners. Um, I just finished helping Patrick write a letter last night to the other commissioners. We are making parity our number one issue in this opioid commission. And we are also making it very clear that you can't treat addiction and, and drug overdoses and the opioid crisis without focusing on mental health. Uh, that's something that I don't mean to politicize this, but a lot of times Republicans have a, a, a bifurcation of, well, you have your mental health, mental health care, and then you have your addiction crisis, and let's solve the addiction crisis, and the mental, we can fix our mental broken mental health. No, the, the mind is one thing. So we, we believe in, in addressing that all at once. So in the Opioid Commission, we're going to make sure that mental illness, and, and also Patrick is adamant yesterday, and he was getting very, very worked up over this, is that we can't solve the, the, op the suicide, the, 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 the opioid overdose epidemic without also so solving the concurrent suicide epidemic we have in this country. I mean, we have over, what is it, 44,000 people died from suicide last year. I mean, that's, that's almost as many as people that died from, from drug overdoses last year. So we want to make sure this commission realizes that, that, that y you have to address mental health and addiction, and you have to focus on parity. Um, the good news is that the federal agencies, they have continued their work on parity uninterrupted. I, I work very closely with some of the, the, the regulators there, and nothing changed from one administration to the other. They're still doing their jobs. They do good work there. Un unfortunately, they're very under-resourced, and that, un that's probably not going to change. Um, but uh, while their work has continued uninterrupted, the work they were doing uh, was in the, in the past was not quite up to the level we needed to be just because of the undercapacity. That's the one thing where the new administration could affect parity, uh, is that if there's future budget cuts, uh, specifically to the Department of Labor, that's the main federal agency for, for enforcement. Uh, if there are budget cuts, that could affect the, the, the level of work that goes on federally related to parity. The good news also is there was something, a law passed late last year called the 21st Century Cures Act. That had a number of provisions related specifically to parity that mandates that the, that the federal government continue to work on parity at least through the end of this year. Uh, one of those things is there's, uh, there's supposed to be a, uh, a stakeholder meeting uh, among state and federal officials to create a, quote, action plan for enforcement uh, of parity both at the state and federal level. Uh, that, 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 that I've talked to my sources in the government that that is, gonna, that is happening, that is going ahead. Um, and they also have to uh, release further guidance uh, that would add some clarity to some of these more confusing components that, that have not yet adequately been addressed. Um, so the, the new administration that I think a lot feared that would mean shutdown of, of any time of regulation related to parity, that has not been the case and, and the work is, is still moving on. Okay, so what does non-compliance look like? Well, we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, so if you have you know, more restrictive outpatient visit limits or more restrictive inpatient day limits or different types of or more expensive co-pays or co-insurance rates, that would be a parity violation. Uh, thankfully, as I mentioned before, the insurance industry has done a pretty good job of cleaning all that stuff up. We don't, that, that, that top level of bullet points, we don't really see those anymore. And that's not to say they don't exist. Uh, and, if, and if you've had experiences where your health plan might seem to have a limit in place, that's a numerical limit that seems pretty restrictive, that there might, there might still be some violations going on there, but that's not really the main problem. The main problem is the non-quantitative treatment limitations. Uh, so for instance, one of the things that is so common is frequent and burdensome prior authorization requirements. So that whenever your, your, your provider says you need to be admitted into a facility, so well, let's do prior authorization first and you need to show this paperwork and that paperwork and fill out this form and the provider needs to get on the phone six different times and talk to the insurer. Now that requirement itself, that's not inherently illegal. But is that how they're doing it for, for cancer? Is that how they're doing it for multiple sclerosis? Is that how they're doing it for people that have had a heart attack? Um, you know, reviews to see if care is medically necessary. That is, that is the number one thing we're seeing the problem. Someone, someone say, had a suicide attempt on Wednesday, admitted to the hospital Wednesday night, is in an inpatient facility on, on Thursday, and on Friday, the, the insurer does the medical necessity review and says, well, the care is no longer medically necessary, you know, coverage denied. Um, 
Is that what they do? So that means that's like if someone has a heart attack, they give them the defibrillators, and then when they go to move them to the, the, the room, they say, no, it's not medically necessary. The heart's beating, so get them out of here. That's, how, that's what we're seeing for mental health care right now is this stuff is, is so much more restrictive. And how do I know that? Am I just, I just, I just assume this? No. What we've seen is when the states that have done in-depth investigations, like the state of California, the Department of Managed Health Care in California, uh, like New York State's Attorney General's Office, when they've done investigations into these things, they have found flagrant violations across the board. So if that's happening in New York and that's happening in California, why do we think that's not happening in Wyoming? Is that, why do we think that's not happening in Kansas or Nebraska or Ohio? And the answer is we're pretty sure that it is. So these are the issues here. This is, this is what we're fighting for right now are these, these medical management practices that insurers use that by themselves, they're not, it's not illegal to use these things like prior authorization or a medical necessity review. But if you're doing it in a way for mental health care that is much more stringent and restrictive than you are for medical care, that's a violation. And that's something that whenever we've looked into that, whenever there's been a review uh, by, by, by regulators, they've found that there have been gross violations. So, uh, that, that's really where we're seeing the main problems. Okay, so what are we doing in the states? All right, so we have, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. You just brought over not compliant state thank you. My name is Dennis, and uh, my health insurance probably thinks they're compliant. And I recently uh, said I'm going to push counselors, and I got a list of the counselors that were seen, you know, on that booklet I got, mm -hmm. online, these are the folks that are seeing people. And really, one through five, we're not seeing patients anymore. Right. And it's interesting because the, the, the health insurance, my employer probably takes everything's honky dory. Oh, yeah. Look at this list. I'm like, number one, nope, can't go. Not seeing new patients, nope, two. Yeah. I'm going down this list going, oh my gosh. It's a, a phantom network. It's uh, a. <laughs> it, yeah. There's a term for it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that, that is, that's the term. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, so that's something called, and this is, some, this is something that the regulators are starting to understand. They got, they got a problem. Is that you have these networks, and you say, well, oh, look, there's 100 providers on here, and like, not taking patients, not taking patients, out of yeah. business, dead. Like, oh, you know, like, dead. that's, like, right. Like, and that's, I mean, I tried to get treatment for my mother last year for anxiety, and there wasn't a, not one of the providers on the list was actually taking patients, or even would answer the phone. We should do that one day. Just film, like, you have to come to my house, it's filming, going through the list, and mm -hmm. put it up on YouTube. Like, this is, people... For visual learners now, yeah, it was unbelievable. One through five, and I was like, I gotta go to their booklet again, get another five. And, 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 and is, how does that relate to parity? Is a reasonable question to ask. Is like, okay, so how do they come up with this list? How do they get these providers on the list? The way, so on the medical side, are you seeing? Are you, are, are are they admitting providers that aren't actually taking patients? Is that I mean, how are they determining who's in their network? And often, if they get into the weeds on that, and you actually look at the data, you're gonna find that they're doing it differently for mental health care and mental health providers than they are for medical providers. And that's a violation of the law. So, yes. Um, so, it's been nine and a half years since I was nearly successful in taking my own life. And I remember going through it. There's a couple things that you spoke to. One, um, when I came out, I was really fortunate to have a really good primary care physician, mm -hmm. phenomenal insurance. Came out of the hospital, I was hospitalized for 10 days. Um, and my portion of the bill after my insurance covered was $95,000. So, talk about salt on an open wound. I had yeah. to file bankruptcy at 26 years old. Um, and then, so that was rough then. And then, um, I was really fortunate to find a therapist, but I kind of went through the whole thing. My insurance wouldn't cover anybody or nobody was available, and I just happened to find this, this man who worked with me and worked on a sliding scale, and he wanted to see me three times a week, and he charged me $15 a session. Wow. So thank God for him. Um, but it was, you know, I mean, he was willing to work with me. I don't think there's very many people out there that do that, and he and my doctor were together. Mm -hmm. The medication they wanted to put me on, um, the medication they had me on the hospital was making me worse. Uh, my doctor finally found the medication that was working, and the insurance company said, well, the, you know, that you've got to fail before you can Right. Work. So yeah. I had to fail through three other prescriptions before they put, and none of them were working before right. they gave me the one that and like, worked, so. And that by itself, is that, is, is that is that inherently illegal? No, but how are they doing that for someone with diabetes? How are they doing that with someone with hypertension? Do you mean, how are they doing that with someone who has who has heart disease? I mean, are they making you fail at three medications, or have, what does that mean? At three heart attacks, or you know, do they do that? Uh, and and usually the answer is no. And I mean, that's and this just speaks to the. I mean, this is really a discriminatory nature of, of, of you know of, of of what people with mental health conditions deal with, and that's that's why we we had the parity law because that used to be just completely legal to do that. Now it's illegal, but we're still seeing that it's not 
um, the insurers, you know, like, like you mentioned with the networks, um, it's the way they're designing things, there's just not enough transparency either. Like, how do we know the way that they're designing their fail first protocol? How do we know, you know, how they're selecting who goes into the network or not? And the answer is, we don't know because we can't see the data and how they, how do you make that? How do you make those determinations on the, on the, med the mental health side versus how do you do it on the medical side? There's no way to know if there's compliance or not without examining that data. And that's something insurers are not giving up right now and we need them to. Um, and so I think that, and that's a perfect segue into the, uh, the, the model legislation that we've been working on at the state level because that's one of the main components of that legislation is to, is to smoke out the insurers. How are you doing things? How, how are you, how are you make, doing these incredibly complicated processes? How are you doing that for medical care and how are you doing that for mental health and addiction care? Um, so the model legislation we have, we created it with our, our national partners like AFSP, like uh, NAMI, Mental Health America, American Society of Addiction Medicine, Bipolar and Depression Support Alliance, a bunch of other national partners. And then we've been uh, working with, with chapters at the state level. And I know that John has mentioned that AFSP is really really focused on, 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 on this work going forward this year and especially going into the next year. Um, and that's the thing, the, the way I can draw up model legislation, but nothing happens without people at the state level uh, who, who, who have not only connections with, with legislators, but also good stories to tell. I mean, that's something that, that's more powerful than anything else is, is telling a story that demonstrates, look, there is a problem here. Um, and what does our legislation do? It fills in gaps in the law, uh, it augments the federal law, and it especially focuses on transparency. And the thing I want to note is we have, so we have this, this a long piece of model legislation, it's six or seven pages, it's got a bunch of different sections. We would never suggest that anyone introduce the entire thing. You need to tailor it for your state. So for instance, when we went to our, our, our advocate friends in Montana and just <coughs> showed them the entire bill, they were like, oh, this will never work. They just threw it out. I said, well, no, no, no. Like, most of this won't work in Montana, but some of it, some of it might. And, and it turns out we were right. And we got it through the, the, the House and the Senate and signed into law just a few weeks ago. So that's the point is the, the model bill that we have, and there's a link to it at the end of this, this presentation that you can, you can go to. It's, it's designed as the framework and the blueprint for, for what we need, but it can be tailored to any state's needs. And we know that what works in New York or California or Connecticut might not work in Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia. Um, so that, that, that's the general framework of it. Um, so what are the key provisions of the bill? Well, the number one thing, as I mentioned, is insurer transparency. It requires insurers to submit data to the state insurance department that would, that would, it would be, it's a comparative analysis. So it requires insurers to do a comparative analysis. How are you, how are you designing and applying these, these medical management practices and your networks on the, the mental health side? And is that s comparable to how you're doing it on the medical and, 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 and surgical side? Um, and and, and it, importantly, it requires them to do that analysis and then provide it to the state regulators so the state regulators can, can check it for compliance because, um, Asking the state regulator to go in and dig around and find that information on their own, that, that makes the work so much harder. So what the legislation does is it asks the insurance companies to do the analysis and then provide that to the regulators. Um, and without that data, I mean, this is, the, this is an important talking point. I'll get to this a little bit in a few minutes. You, you just can't know if there's compliance with, with the, the parity law unless you have this data. There's just, it's just impossible to know that. So I think that that's something that, that needs to be stressed to, to any, anyone, any legislator at the state level. This is necessary because without this data, we just can't know uh, if, if there is compliance or not. And also, the way it works right now is that it, the you know, consumers and, and their family members can ask for that data, but, but they shouldn't be required to check that information. Like, remember that, that, that first, one of those opening slides with that 500-word sentence? I mean. Who, who should be checking that for compliance? Should you be responsible for that, or should the state regulator be responsible for that? I think the answer is pretty simple. It's a state regulator. And to that end, another key provision of our bill is regulator accountability. Um, re requires state insurance departments to do the necessary checking, which is something that, sadly, most of them have not done to this point. Uh, you don't want to legislate that a, a, a state agency do its job. Uh, because often, you know, state agencies, they don't like to be told what to do. But if you're not going to do it, uh, you know, well, then we're going to have to have legislation. Also, you need to, as part of that, make them transparent. Like, all right, we're, we're legislating that you, you do your job, but we want to know exactly how you're doing that. And that actually is, can be surprisingly successful. I know that in Connecticut, um, their state insurance department was not doing a particularly good job on parity back in 2013. So they introduced legislation 
and pass legislation that will require them to do the job, and then file a report with, 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 the, with the legislature and the public. And so, sure enough, they, they got their act together and started doing a, surprise, a very good job. And the reason for that is they didn't want to have to file a report that says, well, we're not really doing anything because we don't feel like it. They, 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 so they decided maybe we should actually do our job and do it well, and then we can put that in the report and we'll look good. And they did. And now they're one of the leaders in the field in terms of uh, enforcement. And also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the legislation provides uh, one of the weaknesses in the federal parity law is it doesn't define doesn't give a, a really conclusive definition for what mental illness and substance use disorders are, and it leaves that either to insurance companies or the states. And some states, like Kentucky, have a, a, a good definition in place uh, of, of what uh, a mental health condition or substance use disorders are. Some, not so much. Some states, uh, they only define mental illness or only require coverage for a certain list of conditions, like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, uh, but, but you know, it might be six or seven conditions. Some states, like uh, Missouri, they have they cover all mental health conditions in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, except for substance use disorders. That's a pretty big exception. And then some states uh, have a definition in place that's just wildly out of date. It probably is from, like I know Maine, for instance, their definition of mental health conditions is, it couldn't have been writ written any later than like 1984. I mean, it's just, it's just very, very obsolete. Um, so that's another component of our bills. We recognize that's a weakness in the federal law, not defining mental illness and substance use disorder. So that's something that is critically important for states to do that, to make sure that there aren't any particular um, conditions that are excluded from coverage. Um, so where are we working right now? So we've been working, uh, preliminary work, we're working in Connecticut, Illinois, Minnesota, Mississippi, Montana, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee. Um, in addition to legislation, we've also been working with some of those states' insurance departments to provide technical assistance. I know one state that hadn't been doing a good job in terms of enforcing the law, but is now doing a fantastic job, is Pennsylvania. Uh, they're doing uh, a wonderful job in terms of checking insurers for some of that complicated non-quantitative treatment limitation stuff we talked about, and they've been working directly with us to, to provide technical assistance to them. Um, but in some of those states, we, in, in almost all of those states there, we, we've introduced our model legislation or components of it. We did have success in Tennessee. That was a state where we got, uh, we got a bill through the, the House and the Assembly and the Senate and signed into law by the governor, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we also saw success in Montana, as I mentioned. That, that bill was just signed into law a few weeks ago. Uh, what that bill does is it protects so that if there anything changes in federal law, the, the parity law will still apply in the small group and individual markets. So that's an important thing that, that can be done at the state level right now, just to protect against any potential collateral damage from any federal legislation. Um, and then states that were, were, were scheduled, we've started to have preliminary conversations with, with advocates in, in Arizona, Colorado, Indiana, Missouri, uh, and Virginia. So those are the states we've been we've either concretely been working in uh, right now, or we've been talking to. Um, but as I talked to, to John earlier, we'd love to see work in every state. Um, we'd love to see a parity bill introduced in every state. Even if we don't think it's going to pass, uh, I think we want a parity bill in every state just to demonstrate that like, this is an issue that's important. Uh, people, when people have health insurance, um, but you, know, you have insurance, but when you need treatment, it doesn't get covered. It gets denied by your insurance company, that's a problem. And that's also something that's probably in violation of, of federal law. So we need to make sure that there's more accountability and enforcement from state regulators and not put the burden on consumers and their family members to determine if there's a violation. Um, OK, so let me talk about how do you have success with legislation. So like I said, we had our successful legislation in Tennessee, which requires insurers to submit the kind of data that is necessary to determine if there's compliance. So that was a bill that was, so that's, that's the first key. You have to have, unless your state has a very, uh, very stacked legislature that's, that's very uh, heavily one side or the other and the governors of the same party, you have to have bipartisan sponsorship on a bill. Without bipartisan sponsorship, you're, just, you're not going to see anything happen. So that's what we got in Tennessee. We had uh, a very, very conservative lead sponsor and a, a, a very, very liberal uh, co-sponsor. Uh, and they were you know, able to, because of their, their co-sponsorship, because you had such deep divides, uh, we were able to get that bill through the Senate 32 nothing, and through the House 89 nothing, and then signed by the Republican governor. So uh, that's bipartisan right there. If you have a bill that goes through unanimously, 
um, and then it, you know, signed into law, that's, that's a demonstration of, of a bipartisan process that, that has worked. Um, and then the next critically important thing is the lead sponsor of the bill, they have to be able to explain to their colleagues what's in the bill and why it's necessary. Um, that was one thing that we were able to do in Tennessee. We were able to, to educate uh, Senator Briggs and Representative Clemens. Okay, so this is, this is what's in the bill. It requires transparency from the insurers. Uh, and this is needed because we know that from work in other states that you know, insurers, they're, they're, they're not in compliance with the law, and this is the only way we can know if they are or they are not in the state of Tennessee is if they submit this data. And both Senator, Senator Briggs and Representative Clemens were able to go to their colleagues and explain that to them. And they, you know, when they said, okay, well, a really conservative senator says we need this, and a really liberal senator uh, representative says we need this, and this is why, they're like, all right, let's vote now. Let's do it. Let's get it signed into law. And they did. And it sailed through very easily. So um, those are probably the, the two most important things you can have, is you need to have that bipartisan <coughs> sponsorship, uh, and you need to have the, if the lead sponsor can't explain it, then no one's going to vote for it. If the guy who has his name on it, or the, the lady who has her name on it, they can't explain it, then there's no reason anyone else is going to vote for it. Um, and one thing that's very important for getting attracting Republican support uh, is, is framing this as a, as a solution to the opioid epidemic, because that's something that's very popular right now uh, among Republican legislators is coming up to, to a, a solution for that, because the number of states, um, you know, a state like West Virginia or a state like Kentucky or Ohio, uh, they've been just devastated by the opioid crisis. And if you frame this, and this is something we did in Tennessee, this is what Senator uh, Briggs, who's very conservative, he framed this to his colleagues as, look, we have an opioid epidemic ravaging our state. This is part of the solution. I mean, they, they couldn't wait to vote for it because of that. So um, that's, that's an important thing to do, is if you tie it to the opioid epidemic, that will help you get the Republican buy-in that will lead to that bipartisan support that, that really makes uh, passage much more likely. And then the most, maybe, maybe the most important thing, though, is if you have a bill introduced, uh, you need people to, to testify, uh, to give testimony at the legislature who had real experience with insurance denials. So if you're someone who's been denied treatment, or if you've been, your medication, you had to fail three times in a me medication, and, or you had to declare a bankruptcy because you weren't, you didn't have coverage, that's, that's important to have those stories told. So for instance, when I testified at the legislature in New Jersey, uh, they let me talk for about two minutes before they're like, I, I, just go away. What, what, I, I don't know what you're talking about. But then when Rocky Schwartz, who's a, who's a, a member of our parody coalition in New Jersey, whose two sons have had serious issues with mental health and substance use disorders, uh, when she went up and testified about the harrowing experiences they had, I mean, she has just some horrific stories about what her sons have gone through and then the denials of treatment and the fact that she spent $300,000 out of pocket. She had another mortgage on her house. The kids, they don't have a college fund anymore because she was more, rather than saving money for college, she wanted to keep them alive. Um, and she told her story in front of the legislature. They let her talk for 20 minutes. And she was scheduled for four, and they, they, they encouraged her to keep on talking. Those kind of stories are riveting. And that's the kind of, when you're a, when you're a legislator and you're sitting there and someone is telling you about how her, her, her son had a suicide attempt self-harm, and then 12 hours later, the insurance company said that care wasn't medically necessary. And she says, I think you should vote for this bill that will help us get you know, further parity. You can't look her in the eye and say, no, I don't think so. We're not going to yeah. do that. And that's, that's the most important key to success, is having people who have lived experience, who have real experiences. I mean, that, that's a powerful message to an, you say to an insurer, like, to, her, to her legislator. I, I had to declare bankruptcy, or I had to pay $80,000 out of pocket, and like, I have insurance, that, and my provider said care was medically necessary, and it was denied. The insurer said it wasn't, I mean, would this have happened to me if I had heart disease? Would this have happened to me if I had leukemia? No, of course not. And that's the kind of message, when you, when you have that message in front of the legislature, that gets legislators into a, into a froth, and they want to get it signed. And they don't care if the industry, insurance industry is opposed. That's what we've had in New Jersey. We're hopeful that we got our bill through the assembly last week. We're hopeful to get it through the Senate on Monday. And the message I've heard from the other legislators, the, the, the insurance industry lobbyist has been fighting back and saying, well, we, we think it goes too far. They've been saying, we don't care what you're saying. We don't care. <laughs> like, go away. Like, <clears throat> we're not interested in hearing from you today, Ward. Like, go sit down. Um, so that's, that's just a, that's a very critical uh, thing to have. You have to have the stories. You can't have eggheads like me sitting up there and talking. It has to be someone who's had a real experience with, with this, who knows uh, the pain involved, too. And then also, I think one thing to, you ha is very critical is to, is to emphasize, you can't know if there's compliance with this law, with a really complicated 
non-quantitative treat limitations, you can't have that without, without the data requested by our bill. So without that data, it's impossible. You just, you just can't know. There's no way to know without having that data, so we need that data, and that's why this bill is necessary. That's the number one message to emphasize is that there, it's impossible to tell unless we have this data. So if, if they, and if the insurance industry says, oh yeah, we're in compliance, like, well then cool, there should be no problem then submitting this data. It should, if you say you're in compliance, that means you must have already done this. Um, and then one thing that's, that's critical that, that is useful is if you read that 500 word sentence that I, that I, that I read earlier, to a legislator and say, you know, is it, you know, you know Senator, is it fair that, that I should be the one responsible for determining if an insurer is doing this in a way that is comparable and no more stringent? If, if, they, if they can look you in the eye and say, yes, they're the, the world's greatest liar, because that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's not fair. It's just not fair to ask a, a, a normal human being to understand what a sentence like that means. And that's like the most important sentence in the, in the regulation. Um, and then also, Absolutely use horror stories of, of his, I mean, I think everyone probably has one of what happens, of how an insurer has denied your treatment. Uh, but then also use a, 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 a positive of what happened when I did pay out of pocket. When I paid out of pocket and got the treatment that I needed, that my, my provider said I needed, I recovered. So Rocky Schwartz, who I mentioned in New Jersey, she has the horror stories of her sons about how they were denied treatment. But the success stories is after spending $300,000 out of her pocket, they're, they're, doing, they're in recovery and they're doing great. I mean, she has a great story to tell about them, and that's the thing. She shouldn't have had to pay for that. Her insurance company should have had to pay for it, and they said it wasn't medically necessary. Well, then how come they're doing so much better now? That's, that's the flip side of the coin. You, you, you shock them. You shock the legislators, but then you show them, but this is what would be possible if the insurer were, were to cover what they're supposed to. Um, so, that, I mean, I think that's the message, and unfortunately, most people don't have $300,000 to spend on treatment. And, that, and that's part of the reason why insurers don't want to cover it either. They don't want to spend $300,000. Mm -hmm. um, and for decades, they've been able to get away with that. Well, now I think the message we want to make to legislators is they're not going to get away with it anymore. And you need to make sure they don't get away with it. And you need to make sure the regulatory agencies responsible for enforcement are doing their jobs. Uh, if they're not going to do their job, like I'm not going to mention any particular states we work in, but there are a number of state insurance departments that just are just not doing their job. Uh, and that's, that's part of this legislation. So I think that's, those are the most important tips and talking points. And then you know, the last thing here is, if you take a look at, the, at our, my slides, the first link there will be is to the model legislation. So when John posts that, you can click on that and see the legislation. And also, one, as part of our project in you know, the last few years, we've been tracking parity implementation in all 50 states. Uh, so if you go to the parity reports, you can see how your state is doing, what legislation has been introduced in the past, what kind of regulatory actions or lack thereof has your state uh, insurance department done. Uh, so those, those, those are the, the relevant links. Um, All right, well, Tim, thank you so much. I think we have about um, seven minutes left uh, for some questions. Um, as a nice segue, Michelle, why don't you share with the group your incredible meeting with your uh, congressman and how you turned the tables on him because he, he came after you. But I don't, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Just, just a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, was a, I asked for a five minute meeting. I've been coming three years and he's never met with me yet. And so I took a chance and our meetings were supposed to be finished early. I took a five o'clock meeting with him and it lasted 52 minutes. And um, one of the first things he did was he said, well, you know, if you're doing all this stuff in West Virginia and around the nation, Michelle, why have I never heard of you? Just, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to stand up. So, um, <laughs> he said, why have I never heard of you? And I said, well, sir, and, you know, I've been coming here for three years. Meet you, and he put his hand out and said, you know, I, I don't hear that. And so I said, you know, well, this is what we're doing in West Virginia, and this is what we're doing around the nation. And then my partner, Connie Berry, attested uh, to some work that she was doing because she works for the only mental health agency that we have doing preventative work in West Virginia. And I said, but what are you doing? I need your help. What are you doing in our state? And what are you doing here in Washington, D.C.? And I just turned it around, and then I had to come back and tell John what I did. <laughs> um, evidently, it's going to be okay. But, and we left, we left on good terms. But, you know, it was he was very defensive, and as was I. And, you know, and I said, we need you. And, you know, we need you to make a difference. And much, yeah, much to Tim's point, this is their job, whether yeah. they're an elected legislator or they're a regulator. Uh, we need to respectfully, but very pointedly, hold them to their job yeah. description. 
and what they're supposed to do. Would yeah. you agree? Yeah, I mean that's the. I mean, it's you shouldn't have to, you know, introduce legislation and get legislation signed a law to require an agency to do their job. But sadly, that's what you have to. And, and you know, to give them some slack, you know, cut them some slack. Uh, they. You know they're overburdened and they don't have the resources. But if you're an insurance department, okay, you don't. Well, we don't have the resources to do parity investigations. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you just need to shut down your investigations on auto fraud for a little while, to, to you know auto insurance fraud, and maybe try to investigate something that's you know you know over 250 people a day are dying from suicides yeah. and drug overdoses. I mean, is that what's more important? Seeing if we have compliance with the law that's designed to address that, or seeing if you know someone's swindling their insurer out of a few thousand dollars on you know a car insurance claim. I mean, not that that's not important to address, but you got to prioritize here. And if you're not going to prioritize the right way, then we need legislation. I had told the it. previous session that anyone that's applied for a mortgage recently, like I did last year, they now have you have to tell in two pages or less exactly what kind of loan you're getting, what the interest rate is, that has to happen in health insurance. Um, I, I have pet insurance, for God's sake, so I got my, I, it's easier for me to submit my bills for my dog, Lucy Hayes, get reimbursed electronically in three days, for God's sakes, okay, for my dog, who I love, but this is crazy. So are there questions, comments, Steve? Yeah, I just want to say, even with good laws, I don't know has a good law like this. Right. But uh, you know, we had a parity task force met with our attorney. We need to get enforcement. So we went to our attorney general, and they were very interested in going after anybody that had a parity problem. They never got any complaints. And so it really needs to be also brought out to get your people to your attorney. General. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's get them to. No, that's a huge. So that's the thing. Um, that's a problem we have in states. Well, we don't. We, we, like a state that I won't name says we we've gotten five complaints about parity in the last three years. It's, well, only four. A, a study by the American Psychological Association got only four percent of people in the country know what that is. How? Do, of course, you're not getting complaints. Nobody knows what it is. So that's what we need, though. Is if you were to if people were to flood their state insurance departments and their attorney general's offices with complaints about parity. Like, I have a parity complaint. You know, I think there's a parity, but even if it's not, just any kind of denial you get for behavioral health treatment, call up the insurance department, call the AG and say, I think I've had a parity violation. I want you to investigate it. If they start getting that volume, they'll say, oh, we better do something. You know, and that's that. I mean, that's 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 the, the the truth of it. So you need to flood anyone and everyone with 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 complaints. Say, I have a problem, and I want you to figure it out. And that's 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 that can be very helpful. We have time for one more comment or question. Anybody else want to say anything? No. I want to say thank you. No. Thank you. Yeah. So again, this will all be on the website. I think Tim's point. Um, we'll be sending out something to each of the chapters. Start collecting the stories. Um, because we need to, you know, put vignettes together because it, it'll be great um, not only to illustrate to the regulators, but it could be potential people who can testify if and when um, state legislatures. I mean, I, I would believe that any legislature worth his or her salt would be running to their parliamentarian to let's introduce a mental health parity bill so our residents can understand and our insurance companies can be the best they can be for their yeah. um, stakeholders, right? This yeah, is, this is a so. non-issue, right? right. It shouldn't I mean, be. look at what happened in Tennessee. If you can get a, a bill like that through 32 nothing in the Senate, 89 nothing in the Assembly, uh, and signed right away by the governor, I mean, I, I think this can get done in any state. Yeah. Yeah. So let's give Tim a round of applause. Our, 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 uh, to, to, Pat, to Patrick's late father, Patrick Kennedy's late father, Ted Kennedy, our work goes on and our dream will never die and we have got to work together yeah. to make sure that um, none of us have to go through what many of us have gone through. Yeah. Okay, so thanks very much. Thanks, John.